the destructive consequences of compassion and empathy-driven politics coming from the left, pushing bad policies onto the people that do not generate positive results, transcends into every left-wing movement. Take, for example, wage inequality. Watch what happens when we put the meaningless word equality into the magic box of leftism. Whoa! Under leftist President Barack Obama, income inequality has grown at a rate about four times greater than under President Bush. About 95% of income gains under the leftist Obama have gone to the top 1% of earners. How does the magic box of leftism turn equality into inequality? Massive regulation that makes business too expensive for startups and therefore favors big corporations. Higher taxes on the wealthy, so they hire fewer of the rest of us, which means wages stagnate and more in the middle class sink into poverty. Amazing. Today, the political left champion wage equality and higher minimum wages and use compassion as their motivator. Why do you want people to be poor, they'll say to the conservative who makes fiscal sense. Nobody wants people to be in poverty, but in a free society, you can't force people to make good choices. But the left will try to shoehorn equality anyway, and this shoehorning of bad policies to make themselves feel better and try to equalize things out never has and never will work in the end, at least not in a free society. It is compassion that motivates the left to solve the problem of wage inequality, but since compassion and motivated politics has made income inequality even worse, we can now use more compassion to fix it by helping people in minimum wage jobs make more money and the government shoving a $15 minimum wage down the throats of American businesses. You make people more expensive than machines, they will be replaced by machines. It's already happening. I promise you that in less than five years, the majority of these fast food, for example, restaurants won't even have people at that window. It'll be a touch screen. And so we do want to help workers with the skills that they need to find the better paying jobs of the 21st century. The basically this trickle up economics, this idea that if you pay people $15 an hour, it will help the general economy. It's, it's evidencing a, a differential point of view with regard to how money is invested and what makes your life as a consumer better. The reality of the situation is that what makes your life better than people's lives were 50 years ago is all the new products and services developed by all the rich people who hire you. All of you out there who I'm sure are not rich, are you working for a poor person right now? Who is hiring you? Who's paying your salary? Unless you're working for the government, and even then you're not, paying, you're not working for a poor person, you're paying for the rich people who actually pay the taxes that pay for you to work for the government. So this idea that economic growth is a function of people making $15 an hour versus $14 an hour is simply not true. The, re the reality of the situation is that what makes the economy grow is new products and services that make your life better and which require millions of dollars in research and development. And as far as the point that was made about the salary of the CEO of Walmart, all I can say is this. See, the Walmart has approximately, they're the biggest employer in the country. They have something on the order of, of 2 million employees across the country. Let, let's say we agree that 20 million is too much. And let's say that we cut that salary to zero. Great, we just gave everybody 10 bucks. Unfortunately for employees, most people don't realize the unintended consequences when the government starts setting pay rates. Minimum wage or entry-level jobs are generally for high school, college, and those people seeking part-time work. They are the first rung on the employment ladder. Black unemployment rates were lower than those of whites as long ago as 1890. Close quote. And in 1930 as well. And in 1930. 1930 was also the last year when there was no federal minimum wage law. If you look at the unemployment rate of black teenagers in 1948, 1949, it is a fraction of what it has been in any of recent decade. Uh, and 1949 was a recession year. So the black teenage unemployment rate in 1949 was a fraction of what it was in even the most prosperous years of the 1990s. And this is because the, the federal minimum wage said you must play, pay every worker at least this much. Yes. And there, when there was no minimum wage, kids, everybody, but particularly you're talking now about black teens, yeah. could get paid whatever a dollar fifty an hour. See, see but the other thing, but they could get employment. They could yes. start learning skills. They could get reach the first rung on the ladder, so to speak. Yes. That's what's, right. And people move up very quickly. I mean, McDonald's has over a hundred percent turnover a year. People say he's out. He's out flipping hamburgers. Yes, he's flipping hamburgers in January. It does not mean he's going to be flipping hamburgers in December. Uh, somewhere he's how to get to work on time, how he, to get a That's right, and he's, and he's not going to be, he's going to start to start up the ladder. Right. Uh, but the, uh, what, what was different about the late 1940s was the minimum, the federal minimum, the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 specified what the minimum wage would be. The runaway inflation of the 1940s made that number meaningless. I see. So for all practical purposes, inflation had repealed the minimum wage law. 
I see. Thank God I, I was a teenager in those years. Uh, and, you know, when I started out my first full-time job as a Western Union messenger, uh, my, my starting pay was 50% above the federal minimum wage because inflation had made the federal minimum wage meaningless. And so under those conditions, in 1948, black 16 and 17-year-olds had, had an unemployment rate under 10% and slightly less than that of white teenagers the same age. Now, as you come in, the liberals say, no, we've, we've got to catch up with inflation. Starting in 1950, they escalated the minimum wage regularly. And then you begin to see these horrendous rates of unemployment among black teenagers. The majority of the Senate Democratic Caucus are now backing a bill that would raise the federal minimum wage to $15 just two years after a comparable bill introduced by Bernie Sanders only received scant support from his colleagues. But now in 2017, a majority of Democrats support increasing the federal minimum wage to $15. Why does this measure receive a majority support from Democrats when just two years ago it only received scant support? What has changed in that two years' time? The economy is actually better than it was back in 2015. So why the support now for the $15 minimum wage? Has economic flipped upside down in the past 24 months and shown that the $15 minimum wage now helps the poor? No, actually the opposite. The places that are phasing in a $15 minimum wage have shown results that one with a basic understanding of economics would expect. Seattle, San Francisco, and New York are good examples. In Seattle, when the wage increased from $11 to $13 on its way towards $15 an hour, low-wage jobs fell by 9% while total payroll went down by an average of $125 per month. Back in 2016, after the $15 minimum wage increase was announced, Seattle experienced its largest three-month job loss in its history, and the rate of teenage employment fell by 38%. San Francisco's minimum wage increase has produced similar results, with 64 restaurants closing in the winter of 2016, and a Harvard Business School study showed an increase of $1 per hour in wages would increase the likelihood of a median 3.5-star restaurant closing by 14%. New York lost over 1,000 restaurants in 2016 thanks for the increased minimum wage laws, and the number of jobs for cooks, servers, and dishwashers grew by only 1.4%, which is less than half of the 4.4% annual growth rate from 2010 to 2015. Fast food industries in New York also grew at a 3.4% rate in 2016 compared to its annual 7% growth rate from 2010 to 2015. So why has support for the $15 minimum wage actually grown among Democrats since 2015? Well, because Democrats lost the election. Now, in order to gain favor among the voter base, they have to do something drastic. Think about it. They rejected this measure two years ago, but support it now, despite the economy improving and clear examples and evidence that increasing minimum wages to $15 an hour is harmful. The only reason Democrats are pushing this awful $15 minimum wage agenda is the same reasons they always push bad policies to win votes. Left-wing policies of compassion don't work, but it doesn't matter. It's not about what actually works. To the left, politics is a PR game. It's about looking good, winning votes, not actually making things better. Left-wing policies of compassion do not work because their goal isn't improving conditions. It's about winning votes, growing government, and growing their power. Christopher Latch once wrote, is is it really necessary to point out at this late date that public policies based on a therapeutic model of the state have failed miserably over and over again? Far from promoting self-respect, they have created a nation of dependence. They have given rise to a cult of the victim in which entitlements are based on the display of accumulated injuries inflicted by an uncaring society. The politics of compassion degrades both the victims by reducing them to objects of pity and their would-be benefactors who find it easier to pity their fellow citizens than to hold them up to impersonal standards, the attainment of which would make them respected intellectuals in society, quote, intellectuals give people who have the handicap of poverty the further handicap of a sense of victimhood. Yes. Close quote. Explain that, Tom. They, intellectuals have a great tendency to see poverty as a great moral problem to which they have the solution. Now, the human race began in poverty, so there's no mysterious explanation as to why some people are poor. The question is, why have some people gotten prosperous? And in particular, why have some gotten prosperous to a greater degree than others? But everybody started poor. So poverty is not a mystery to be solved by intellectuals. More than that, I think one, one of the things I wish I'd put more emphasis on in the book is that intellectuals have no interest in, in what creates wealth and what inhibits the creation of wealth. They are very concerned about the distribution of it, but they act as if wealth just exists somehow. So and it's only a question, it's like manna from heaven. It's only a question of how we split it up. And why should that be? Why shouldn't they find that question, at least intellectually, fascinating? Because it would destroy the whole vision that they have. If because it would lead to the answer of free markets. 